Good morning. Stay seated just one moment. I want us to pray for our nation, uh, pray for the Trump family, pray for the families of those who lost uh, collateral damage and uh, those that were hurt. <clears throat> you know, it's a time where uh, this really, uh, to some degree, is a reflection of our own faith in Christianity. There are emotions, deep emotions on both sides, and uh, the reality is our one emotion is God heal our land and heal those who are hurt, uh, remove hatred from the core of our being, uh, all of those things so that we don't react and respond uh, in a carnal, fleshly way. We want to pray for everyone. And uh, I never want what's happening out in that world to penetrate the church and affect what God wants to do in here. And that can do that. And, uh, you know, there are people in here with different thoughts and ideas. And and it's okay to have thoughts and ideas and, and deal with them and, you know, but, but don't make other people suffer if you're suffering. Uh, you know, don't make other people angry if you're angry. Don't be, make other people hate if you hate. There's no room for hate. Uh, so let me pray and ask you to agree with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for our nation first and everyone in this great nation. So much going on and so much chaos and there is a lot of concern, but Lord, we know that we have the spiritual insight and intelligence that you are God and that we have nothing to fear, but we have a lot of work to do. Help us to do that. Lord, we pray for the Trump family that you would uh, bring peace and healing uh, in the days to come, that there would be no fear, God, that uh, uh, you would protect everyone in this political race, that there would be no physical damage or harm on either side. Uh, that you would cause America to behave. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now stand to your feet with me if you would, please. You're looking pretty good today. Don't get too excited, it's dark. <laughs> Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what the Bible says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of God, and I boldly confess, my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I will never be the same again. Never, 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 in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, as you can see on the screen, we went from the series on heart to the series on IQ. I've never done this series before, so bear with me as I journey through uh, this first sermon today to try and bring everything together and yet separate everything out. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind when you see those letters IQ, you go, well, you know, uh, it's a measurement of how smart I am or the lack of intelligence I have. And oftentimes it's, it's limited in our thinking to mental intelligence. Now, I, I hope this will encourage some of you. Uh, there's not only mental intelligence, there's emotional intelligence. There's cultural intelligence. There's emotional intelligence. There's relational intelligence. So many different ways for you to become who God wants you to become. And so much of society, the most important part, uh, this will sound really bizarre, obviously spiritual intelligence uh, having insight into who God is as much as we possibly can and who God is to us and in us, that's very important because sometimes our minds will lie to us. Uh, your mental intelligence might have you believe because you were taught you're nothing. Uh, you didn't score well in school. You, you don't have a high IQ. And, and as a result of that, you have limited your life to a test score or the opinions of others, when in reality you may have a very high level of relational intelligence that opens doors for you to do what God's called you to do. You're not an accident, and God did not short you and, and create a limited capacity. However, he did probably create a greater capacity in certain areas. Emotional intelligence, for instance, there are people that are very empathetic and very sympathetic and know how to make other people 
uh, feel better and, and get better. It's, it's a wonderful intelligence to have, this emotional intelligence. And I, I would say that women probably have a greater sense of emotional intelligence than men. Now, I don't have scientific proof of that, but ladies, I, there's just something about you that seems to handle. And yeah, you can be emotional, but they're all over the place. That's not a bad thing. It really isn't. It, it, for people to cry, I used to think crying was a weak thing for men, and now I just love it. No, I sit sometimes, I think I'm so stupid. I'm watching this thing, and I, I kind of have tears when something starts. I'm like, I'm like, are my estrogen levels way high? I don't know. Do I need to see a doctor? I'm not sure. But, uh, and so, you know, with that, who knows what you can become, how many people you can help, and all of those things. It's, it's, it's important for you to understand that. So don't get afraid uh, about when you see IQ. Matter of fact, the whole reason I feel like God put this in me was to comfort those of you who say, you know, I, I didn't excel in school, and I, I didn't do well on tests. Therefore, my life is going to be limited. I'm less than other people. No, you're not. You just haven't found which intelligence you need to be operating in. Now, the beautiful thing is all of us can have a very high spiritual intelligence quotient. We can have that. God will open the Bible to you and, and open his word to you and put it in your heart and you can know how to respond. You say, what does that mean? Well, if you grew up in a home, for instance, that was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, that is spiritual ignorance because the Bible tells us that's not right, that's not accurate. And so your whole life, you've been getting people back and after you get them back, I got to admit, when you get somebody back at first, it really does feel good. I mean, it does. I mean, can we get real? I mean, it, it doesn't it? I mean, like, gotcha. You know, I mean, that's flesh. Now, that's spiritual ignorance because about a week later, you're not going to feel so good because the devil will come and say that. Because the devil's a liar. He's a tricker. And, and he will make you feel guilty for the thing that, that you let him make you do. He ain't a friend, trust me. And so when you do something like that, uh, it, it doesn't work long term. And, and so uh, when you get spiritual intelligence, you learn how to forgive and you'll be forgiven. Well, you know, there are people that are hard to forgive. And, and, and until you do it, the Bible says you won't be forgiven. Now, it means you're going to feel the weight. You're carrying around another person in your soul that is weighing your soul down because you've you kept them in there. You haven't forgiven them. And it doesn't make sense. It's not logical. Not at all. It, it just does not make sense. So, so much of what the Bible teaches us does not make sense to our mind. So when I start talking about mental intelligence, realize what me mental intelligence is this. Potentially, mental intelligence becomes the lid on the container of spiritual intelligence. So if, if I had a 50-gallon drum up here, I can fill that drum up, and it's full, and it's got 55 gallons of whatever I put in it. But the minute I put that lid on and strap it down, what's inside there no longer has any way of helping me until I take that lid off. So some of us in our mental intelligence have minimized our spiritual intelligence. As a matter of fact, there are people who are so really IQ-wise brilliant that they don't believe in God, they trust in their mind. And, and so they've never taken the lid off to realize that if you, you mix spiritual intelligence with mental intelligence, great things happen. But when they are separate from one another, uh, it minimizes or lessens our capacity to be who God wants us to be and what he wants us to do. And so everyone can experience this level of intelligence by simply, like being in church, for instance, and, and basically I can subtitle this, you know, I said this is spiritual intelligence, but under subtitle will be, it's just not logical. So much of the Bible makes no sense to the mind of man. Let's get real. The reason many people don't like the Bible or read the Bible because we try to read it and really grasp, okay, so like, I'm going to go through this in a moment. I'm going to pitch this out there just for a minute. But it, it makes no sense that Jesus, the very Son of God, not logical here, runs into a blind man. And we know that we saw Jesus do all kinds of miracles in the Bible. We saw them. 
But some of the miracles, even some of the miracles were weird. They really were. I mean, Jesus spoke to people. They walked. He touched people. They were healed. But then one day, this blind guy's blind, and Jesus spits in, in dirt. I mean, we're talking loogied out here. Hawk Tui. I know you won't hear this. If you're looking for a finesse church, you're in the wrong house. Because I have none. And then he mixes it up and he puts it in this dude's eyes. Now, can you imagine? You can't see. And you feel something warm and wet and grimy. You're thinking, what's up? And he's got mud in his eyes. It's not logical. Why? Jesus, why? Why couldn't you just said, see? No. It's not logical. Do you think, though, when that mud was removed, and I don't know if it dried or not. I never thought about it, but it was removed, and now you can see. Do you think that man went, I can't believe you just spit and put that stuff in my eyes. What's up with you? No, he's like, don't really care. Why? He had a spiritual intelligence. His mind says, this is gross, but his eyes say, this is blessed. <laughs> and sometimes God does things that make no sense. Matter of fact, quite often makes no sense. Now, it makes perfect sense to your spiritual eyes and your spiritual intelligence, but your mind goes, how in the world does this work? You see, there are a lot of churches today, and I'm not trying to be critical, but I'm going to be really honest because I'm the most not political correct person in the world, and I know that. Forgive me ahead of time. But you realize there are churches today that believe that parts of the Bible are not for today. You say, well, how can they believe that? They don't believe in miracles. Folks, I believe in miracles. Here's the problem. Mental intelligence takes matters into its own hands and takes the miracle out of God's hands. So when you take matters in your own hands and you determine mentally how things are going to happen, it removes the miracle power of God because faith is what moves him. So when people say, well, it's just never going to get better, you're right for you. It's not going to get better. Why? Because you just said it wasn't. You just put the lid on any possible move of God's spirit because what you're telling your daddy is you can't do it. It's not possible. And see, with man, he said, some things are impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. Now, when he says nothing is impossible, here's what he means. Nothing is impossible. <laughs> and so if we really take the word literally, this is where your spiritual IQ, your spiritual intelligence elevates when all of a sudden you decide to believe God regardless of what you've seen, regardless of what you've experienced, you're going to believe God. Job had this revelation and charismatics hated this line, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Job wasn't saying God is a slayer. He said, but if he wanted to, nothing is going to change my mind about God. Nothing is going to change my mind about God. You say, well, I prayed for somebody and they died anyway. They got healed supernaturally. Now, I don't, I, I, you say, well, is there healing? I'm going to tell you, when I die, if I do, <laughs> you, you think I'm ever going to want to come back here? I mean, come on. I'm going to be on streets of gold instead of driving down uh, I-74 where the lawn's not mowed on the center median. It drives me crazy. I want to be a mayor or governor for a week. Mow the dead gum lawn. At least spruce it up a little bit. You don't have to pave it with gold, but get the out there. Get the lawn. <laughs> so people have used 
things that didn't happen the way they wanted them to happen or thought they should happen to discount the Spirit of God. And our spiritual intelligence tells me that nothing is impossible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He began a work in me, and he ain't going to quit until I'm dead and done. He's not going to stop. He's never finished with you. He's never done with you. Somebody else might be. Somebody might have told you you're no good, you're washed up, and you're done. You can think what you want to think. God's never finished with me. And if God's not going to be finished with me, I'm not going to be finished with God. Story in the Bible of a man named Ittai who is an unknown. You'd never know him. Even Bible, some people who've read the Bible through would never remember this one guy named Ittai. He was a Gittite. He was not an Israelite, wasn't a Pelethite, wasn't a Kerizzite, wasn't a Termite. He was just a regular guy who was a Gittite. He finds himself in the middle of a family squabble in 2 Samuel 15. Absalom is trying to take the kingdom away from David. David, as we know, kills a giant. I mean, we got, David was a warrior. And yet, because of the people and because of his love for God, Absalom, his son, is trying to take over the kingdom. David says, let's leave. We don't want a war. And, and, and he leaves. And, and all of a sudden, this out of nowhere, this name pops up, Ittai the Gittite. And it says, all his men marched past him, David did, along with all the Carathites, Pelathites, and all of the 600 Gittites. Now, there's something important here that, that's known. There was, he didn't say there were, you know, 1,200 uh, Carathites or Pelathites, but he says there are 600 Gittites who had accompanied him from Gath, marched before the king. The king said to Ittai the Gittite, now we don't know how this relationship came to be, but my guess is that Ittai had something about him that caused King David to be attracted to who he was. And, and I believe it was spiritual intelligence because Ittai doesn't have to go to war. In the next few verses, David says, look, you just need to go back and be where Absalom is. You can live in the kingdom. You don't have to go to war. He's going to chase me. He's going to try to kill us. Just go back and support him. You and the 600 Gittites, go back and be safe. Doesn't that sound like a good thing to do? I mean, most of us would say, cool, dude. Uh, yeah, you guys deal with your own issues. But he had a spiritual intelligence. Something told him this man named David has the anointing and the appointing of God on his life. And I would rather die under the anointing than live outside of it. This is spiritual intelligence. I would rather obey God. I would rather be around anointing. I would, and not even understand it makes no sense, but I know where I need to be. You see, the Bible says the footsteps of the righteous are ordered by God. That means that we don't wake up like the whole world wakes up and just randomly says, today, here's what I'm going to do. We wake up and we surrender every day and say, God, today, I'm asking you to order my steps. Let me be where you want me to be today, when you want me to be there, with whom you want me to be. This is called spiritual intelligence, saying my life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. And I believe David saw that in this man named Ittai. Now, going to 2 Samuel 6, jumping back, you may recall the story of Israel having the Ark of the Covenant, and for some unknown reason, they put it on a cart that was being pulled by an ox. And so they're walking along, and, and you say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, the ark of God represented the presence of God. And the presence of God was to be carried on the shoulders of man in the Old Testament. Now, of course, in the New Testament, when Jesus came and died, he said, I'll leave another with you, the Holy Spirit. He is now within us. So the presence of God is within us. We carry the presence so I believe, this is just my interpretation, that Israel was in disobedience in that moment. 
The ark is supposed to be carried on, on poles, two men front, two men back, carried and carried and carried. And all of a sudden, the ark begins to fall off of the cart, and a man named Uzzah grabbed it to catch it. You'd think this is a good thing. He doesn't want this precious piece of furniture, if you will, to fall off. Well, when he does, he dies. Why? Because he touched it, and they weren't supposed to be carrying it that way, and he dies. And David gets angry. Now, this is what I love about David is there's an authentic presentation in the Bible about who David was and who he wasn't. Now, at the end of the day, David had enough spiritual intelligence to have a heart after God. So here's what I'm saying to you. Even though we, when we talk about David, and I talk about him from a different angle because I've messed up, most pastors talk about him, and all they talk about is he was a man after God's own heart. Yeah, but let me tell you, David was messed up from the neck up oftentimes. <laughs> His mental intelligence from time to time, he saw, and he did, he killed, he did, and all of a sudden he gets mad at God because his friend is killed touching the ark. So David says these words. He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months. Now, Obed-Edom's a Gittite. What was Ittai? He was a Gittite. So Ittai, whether or not in this verse, he's at Obed-Edom's house. He's watching the blessing of God because of the presence of God that is in the house. So in verse 15 or chapter 15, when he's following David, he says, hold it. I know one thing. I have spiritual intelligence. Wherever that box is and the people that belong to it, those are a blessed people. And because they're a best blessed people, I don't know how this works. I'm not an Israelite. I've just seen this box that they carry around called the ark. And everywhere that thing goes, the blessing of God goes. So he's elevating his spiritual. It makes no mental sense that he would follow David who... His son Absalom wants to kill him. He's saying, I'm a part of David. That means he's going to want to kill me too. That makes no sense to the mind. It's not logical that you would follow somebody knowing that they are going to probably be killed. But you know one thing better, that being in the presence of God with someone being chased is better than living outside the presence with God, of God with somebody chasing them. You see, your alignment is critical to your assignment. If you don't align yourself, which is spiritual intelligence, with people of God, you find yourself misaligned and you will miss your assignment. Ittai said, I am not leaving anybody who has anything to do with this ark, with this presence. I'm staying there. It's like people say, you know, I don't need to go to church anymore. I, I, and listen, I'm a pastor, and I'm going to say something you'll never hear. I don't get this whole thing either. I, I don't, I, but I, here's what I do get. The Bible says don't forsake this thing we call the church. Don't forsake it. Don't quit coming. Don't quit. Don't separate yourself. That's what the Bible says. And we're better together than we are apart. And there's a synergy, a spiritual synergy that happens when you get hundreds of people together to worship the King and of Kings and Lord of Lords and surrender and take our focus off our issues and ourself and just for a moment standing around people who are different than you, dress different than you, talk different than you, act different than you. It's like God saying, I made you all so beautifully wonderful, and you're nothing alike, and you're going to eventually find that out. That's how come he said, love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. You love yourself. Love your neighbor. Come on, man. We all had neighbors that were going. Tell them I'll call them back. <laughs> we all have neighbors. That, that we It's almost like God saying, look, you're, it's going to take a spiritual intelligence to address people who are... Thank you. When somebody really stupid and they get stupid around you, it takes a forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. They dumb. Forgive them, please. God help me. 
I need help. And then you feel guilty because you've been needing help now for about six years. <laughs> Spiritual intelligence keeps the lid of mental capacity off of you like you start thinking you know everything. Just admitting. Humility is being willing to be wrong, willing to admit you're wrong. Humility is not a weakness. Humility is one of the strongest things we have. It's to humbly stay. That's spiritual intelligence. You're trying to prove to somebody you're somebody. I had a, a total breakdown when I was 28 years old. Because my whole life I played sports and I cannot recall one game that my dad saw me play. And I was good. <laughs> Y'all needed to know that. I wasn't like sitting on the bench or nothing, you know. <laughs> hey, Dad, I'm over here. Mom never has to wash my uniform. I played the whole year, never had to do laundry. But... I, I was constantly, I didn't realize, I realized this until I had an emotional breakdown at 28, that I wanted my dad's approval. I was working for the wrong thing. See, you're looking around for things, and, I, and you're trying to, trying to get other people. And the reality is spiritual intelligence says it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And so when I realized how much God loved me and that if nobody else loved me, he loved me, I didn't have anything to prove. I don't have anything to prove. I realized that what I was going through was I had this mind thing happening and I felt like I needed things I didn't need. There are things you think you need that you don't need. You can have a wonderful life. Now, don't get me wrong. I think we ought to, I think we ought to have, uh, I think other, we, other people are, it's nice to be kind, have people say nice things and kind things. That's all good. But when you have a spiritual intelligence, it doesn't matter. So here Ittai is, going back to Ittai. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom because David said, I'm done, I'm out. I can't be around this. I can't bring this into my house. I don't deserve it. He's having a moment. So it was in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. Ittai sees this, and as he moves forward to, to chapter 15... He tells David, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. Where that goes, I'm going. You see, this is a level of spiritual intelligence that helps us get beyond ourselves. It helps, mental intelligence helps us to know what? Spiritual intelligence helps us to know who. So spiritual intelligence, I, I, I've got to know God. It still makes no sense to me. The whole idea of church makes no sense to me. The idea of one man dying for the sins of all mankind, past, present, future, makes no sense to me. It's not logical. Is that right? It's not logical. Until you go back and you read the Bible and you go, the only son of God, the only begotten son of our creator, a perfect man, 33 years on earth, never sinned. That's what it would take. If Jesus would have messed up one time, we'd all be in hell. And so when we come together, planted in the house of God, we get stronger. And so when I say this, look, when people entertain, well, you know, I'll go to church, I'll go to church. I'm, I'm going to spend a little time on this because I get you. I really get you. I get the idea. And some of you watching online say, I can just watch online. Yeah, you can. But you're still missing out on some things as you watch online. You're missing out on the fellowship, on serving on being around other people, on having to like people who are different than you. See, religion, everybody dressed the same. Men wore monkey suits, I mean suits. And, and, and look, I love it. I, I think it's very cool dressing up. I think it's cool every now and then. 
my wife, who grew up in a very traditional church, everybody dressed just alike, everybody looked nice. I kind of like the fact that we all don't look the same. It, it really is, it, to me, it's, it's seeing the beauty. That's why I call this mosaic, a bunch of broken pieces of humanity brought together to make a beautiful picture of God's creation. And, and so, to me, uh, that's how come, you know, many don't believe in miracles. They think there was this an age of miracles, not a God of miracles. And, and it saddens me because my spiritual intelligence tells me that God can do anything. And I've told you this story, and I'll tell it over and over and over and over and over and over again. Because as I got, when I got born again, I didn't know the Bible. I, I had no spiritual intelligence whatsoever. As a matter of fact, I thought... Good people went to heaven, bad people went to hell. That, that was my thing. That was my level. And I thought, well, that sounds pretty good. I mean, it makes sense. I got to tell you, I don't know how some people are going to get there because they're just mean Christians. I think there's going to be a suburb that says mean Christian community. I don't know how, I don't know how God's going to do this. But, you know, so when I got born again, I, I was, I was, I really was embarrassed by church because I went to a really, a chandelier swinging church. And man, I never invited any of my friends because we never did. I mean, it, we were better than the circus <laughs> and we didn't even charge for tickets. I mean, it, it was strange to me. Now, again, I'm not, I, I, it was just weird for me because I thought, you know, I, um, I loved the results of God, but the results of God are not achieved by the emotions of man. They're achieved by our understanding of the Spirit of God. So I had everything connected. This church connected. If God was there, everything was emotional. Now, I'm not against emotions. I'll talk about that. I'm not against that. But, but let me tell you something. My experience was when God took care of me, it wasn't emotional at all until after it happened. So I, I had gotten injured really bad playing sports in high school where my neck was tweaked to the point where my whole right side, I could not raise my arm this high. And when you play quarterback, that's not a good thing. But we didn't have another one, so I was the only sucker. And this was not a big school, and so because of that, we didn't have all the fine equipment. And so I got hurt so bad the rest of the year, I just have to pitch to the tailback, and he'd do all the passes because I, I couldn't throw. But there wasn't anybody else, so I just did it. Well, I didn't think about years to come. How many, when you're young, you think you're never going to die? <laughs> when you're young, everything's going to be fine. You know, I'm going to be fine. Little did I know that about five years after that or six years after that, I would be driving down the road and my arms would go numb. Then literally, I couldn't feel my hands, couldn't feel my arms. I'd be driving. It's a little scary. And how many of you know, probably something wrong there. Wouldn't you think it's just not normal? Oh, my arms are numb. Everybody goes through that. So I had this idea that privately I would go see a doctor. I was in my 20s, and I think I was 20, 20 and a half, because I got born again at 21. So it was right before I got born again, I, I went to the doctor, and he said, well, you have calcium deposits on your spine, and uh, they're restricting blood flow to your limbs. Very scientific. Mentally made sense. Had the x-rays. He said, I said, so what do we do? He said, well, we, we will cut you here and we will scrape your spine. I can't wait. So exciting. So I get born again, and I think I start hearing getting spiritually a little bit intelligent. And how many of you know that you can get spiritual real fast when you're in that position? I got spiritual. I was in church all the time. I think if I go to church, everything will be fine. Well, it wasn't church, church but church created a, an environment for me. And, and I thought, okay, God, I'm going to get myself in this environment where your presence is, your invisible presence. And, and, and then I hear this in my heart. I don't know anything, so I hear this in my heart. Raise your hands. Look, man, I'm barely saved if there is such a thing. You've heard me say you're either saved or you're not. That was when I thought I'm barely saved here, God, okay? Don't make me lift my hands. Don't make me do anything like these crazy people. But then all of a sudden I went, do I want to have my spine scraped? Or behind door number two, lift your hands. So I started here. Yeah. 
It was like I could hear God say, <laughs> really? I did this and you're going to do this? So I said, okay, God, a little more. Same thing. And finally, I lifted my hands as high as I could lift them. I felt like the str- I felt like I was the only guy in the church. I thought, how silly is this? You ever felt that? Yeah, no, don't admit it, because I know you're going, oh, not me. I'm so righteous. <laughs> no. And all of a sudden, after that, everything went away. Now, this has really been interesting, because this was uh, over 40 years ago, okay? Recently, this has tried to come back. And I said, oh, no. Oh, no. I'm not. I smart now. <laughs> I got spiritual intelligence. And I said, no, devil. That was healed a long time ago. Amen. That was healed a long time ago. <laughs> now, I don't fault anybody that wants to do it the other way. Hey, listen, if you like anesthesia and you like fentanyl and Oxycontin, I mean, go get surgery. I mean, how are you? I'm good. I don't take any medication. I hate medication because I did drugs when I was young, and they scare me now. And so I, uh, I don't like them. I don't, I, I, Susan will make me take an ibuprofen sometimes. If I, you in pain? No, I'm fine. <laughs> what makes you think that? I'm good. The point is that spiritual intelligence will help you make decisions and take the lid off because the mind says, no, miracles are not for today. God doesn't do that anymore. That's what your mental mind, because let's face it, even not today, people that saw miracles in the Bible when Jesus was doing them had a hard time believing them. So I'm not faulting anybody who goes, man, I'm not sure. But you know what? Here's what I tell people. If you don't believe in miracles today, wait until you get sick. You're going to believe in them. Wait until the doctor gives you a really bad report. Now all of a sudden, I believe. And that's okay. God's not going to go, nope, too late. I'm going to punish you because all these years you denied me. That's how people look at God. God's going, finally, I've got something to work with. I can mix my power with their faith and watch what I can do. (laughs) Nothing's impossible with God. Spiritual intelligence tells me on the worst of days and when things look horrible and irreparable, enter God. So what I do is, is I wanted to bring this container up here and just say when you, this little bitty thin lid, if you're a Tupperware person. See, if I say Tupperware, men are going to go, he knows about Tupperware. That's a woman thing. I know all about Tupperware. It's great. Some other cool stuff they've got. And it's a container holding the substance and the lid's the only thing keeping that substance in there. You see, some of you, the only thing keeping the miracle hidden from you is the mental lid you have put on your life that said, God doesn't do that anymore. My husband's an idiot. Tell God he's an idiot. God, I know you can change him. I can't. I'm having enough trouble with myself. But God, I pray for him. Instead of telling them what to do, listen, men don't take instructions well. We don't take directions well. Women, let me just help you out. Pray for us, okay? Don't tell us what to do. It'll only make it worse. I'm sorry that that's our humanity. Now, I'm getting better. When Susan sometimes tells me what to do, I just don't say anything. (laughs) Do you do it? When it's time. No, and I, we've had these discussions. It's really great. I said, honey, look, I don't mind you asking me what to do, but don't tell me when to do it. Now, some of y'all just, my credibility went down right there. Some of you, I, no, 
I mean, we, 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 you know, I have to, I have to, my spiritual intelligence rises up. And every now and then I have to pop the lid off. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is spiritual intelligence is the foundation to all of life. When you lack something mentally, God makes up for it spiritually. Literally, what you, you were put here on this earth by design. You have a purpose. You have strengths. You have knowledge of things. You have wisdom. You have capacity. And many people just quit looking because somebody came. You're in the sixth grade, the twelfth grade. They put a lid on you and said, you'll never become that. And they sealed it. And you've never taken it off. You can't do that. And you've lived under the conditions of somebody else's opinion long enough. I tell people all the time, go be what God made you to be. Do what God called you to do. And you know what? You'll be happy doing it. All I ever told my kids was, and all I tell them this day, do what brings joy to your life. You don't have to worry about anything else because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And, 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 and the thought of me, for me personally, had about a two-year period where I thought, I, this, is all I, this is all that brings me joy. Whether I'm good at it or not, loving people, helping people, encouraging people, preaching God's word is my life. If somebody said, we'll, we will buy you out if you'll stop. There's not enough money in the world to keep me from doing this job that God has called me to do. Because money is not my happiness. Doing the will of God is my happiness. Doing the will of God is my joy. I know people who are wealthy out of their mind. They're the most unhappy people in the world. And they're not mean people. They're not bad people. They just exercise their mental intelligence without including their spiritual intelligence. And, and, you know, maybe they had a gift to do something else that would have made just as much money, but they, they decided to do what they're doing instead of following God and trusting that they would. Next week, I'll be talking about it's just not logical. And the whole world is, is figuring, trying to figure things out logically. And I say this with all due respect, and this is an opinion I have, that God does the illogical so that we will exercise faith and bring pleasure to him. It is not logical that God would do surgery on my spine without leaving scars. Now, I know some people say, yeah, did he really do that? I wish I had the x-rays today. I would show you. And I want you to prepare for miracles. Miracles are illogical. They make no sense to mankind. But God made us. Nobody knows how to fix us like he does. And when I say that, if you are emotionally traumatized, mentally traumatized, you've been abused, relationally you are abandoned, you've been neglected. Culturally, you don't get this, and culture is a real tough one I'll talk about. Even in the Bible, there many people don't realize the Bible is, is theological, historical, and cultural. And most people only read the Bible from a theological perspective about God. But God worked in the Bible, writes about cultural issues in the Bible, there are historical issues reported in the Bible. They're all biblical. They're all canonized. I'm not minimizing that, but I'm saying we have to understand things categorically in order to live those things categorically. And most of the time, we don't do that. We, we find out a, a constitution, a bylaw, or a denominational you know, routine. This is what this denomination believes. And if you go in, and again, I'm not, please forgive me. I don't mean any disrespect, but... I couldn't go somewhere where they minimized the work of the Holy Spirit. I couldn't attend a church where they didn't believe in miracles. I couldn't go somewhere where God didn't have an opportunity to override everything I know about life by his Holy Spirit. 
to me, he's as, al as alive today as he was then. He's just not having to walk through the earth physically. And this is where we're, we, we get in trouble is when we try to figure God out, our mental intelligence. Paul said, don't you know we have the mind of Christ? We have to think thoughts conducive to his word. If I want a miracle, I need to believe there's a miracle awaiting. You see, it doesn't cost you anything to believe that God is alive. It doesn't cost you anything to believe he's still doing today what he's always done. It doesn't cost you anything. I don't know why we get so opposed to the wonders of God and the blessings of God. It still makes no sense to me. It's illogical that he said, bring the whole tithe or the tenth into the storehouse. Give me 10% of your income. God says, give me 10% for that there might be food in my house. Now, I, I got to tell you guys, I mean, just from a logical standpoint, mental standpoint, it doesn't make sense to me. And if you think it makes sense to you, I'd like to know how because you're not investing it in the stock portfolio where they're going to promise a certain amount of return. God says, bring it in. He says, see if I won't open the windows of heaven, pour out such a blessing, you won't have room enough to contain it all. So, hold it. How do you, how do you take 10% and then all of a sudden you turn that into some kind of overflow? i just being honest with you. But this is where spiritual intelligence says, I don't have to figure it out to trust him. You will spend the rest of your life trying to figure out something that God said or did. You can't tell me how the North Star was created and the galaxies and all, and how the sun all, and the earth and the, uh, you can tell me it does it, but figure out how it happened. The very fact that you're breathing right now makes no sense. That your heart pumps at a certain pace. Some, some of y'all right now, it's really beating. Going, What's it going to be done? <laughs> so what I'm saying is this. Everybody has faith. But the question is, what's your faith in? Is your faith in your mental capacity? Is your faith in the brain? Oh, and by the way, who gave you your brain and why are you smart? Oh, may have had something to do with God. I'm just saying, let's exercise that possibility. So what I'm saying is everything that's wonderful about us, everything that's wonderful in this world is because of him. Everything. And the more we understand that, the more we allow that, the more we exercise that, the more of God that we experience. So this week, get ready for next week. It's radical. It's illogical. Get ready. This week, I want you to go home and write down one thing that you want God to be involved with. Not 10, just one. Just say, God, I want you to be involved here. Because so many times we exclude God from things that we can't see the possibility that God could even get involved with it and fix it. One thing. God, here's what I want you to be involved with this week. Now, I'm a pastor. I get to write down five. I'm the teacher. But God, so much of God made no sense to everybody else. The 600 Gittites, they followed Ittai because they believed in his spiritual intelligence and they reaped the benefits of being with him. Follow the wrong people, get the wrong results, listen to the wrong voices, make wrong choices. Never limit God. Take the lid off and I'm not discounting our need for mental intelligence. It's a wonderful thing. But without spiritual intelligence, nothing else will glorify God. Nothing else works right without us trusting him.
Let's pray. Father, we, we're going to do everything that we can in our power this week to give what power we have to you. Because our power without your power is finite. Our power with your power is infinite. It has no end. It has no limitations. You raise the dead. You heal the sick. You touch the lepers. You put people in positions that we wouldn't put in positions today. Just because they didn't have the mental intelligence. But they had the spiritual insight and the spiritual intelligence to know who you were. Think about all the mistakes of David, Elijah, Peter, Paul. I think about all of the things that they did prior to surrendering to you and allowing their spiritual intelligence to increase. Lord, help us to trust you more, to obey you more, to follow you more, to love you more, knowing that, God, all the issues and the dramas of our lives cannot compare with the supernatural power that you possess and have deposited in us. You said if the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us, that that same Holy Spirit, the very person of the Holy Spirit would quicken our mortal bodies. So Lord, today we surrender to you and we purpose to increase our spiritual intelligence. With every head bowed, every eye closed, we're gonna pray a prayer that will make a huge difference in your life. If you are not a Christian, when you become a Christian, God will live in you and work through you. So I want to ask everyone watching online, watching this recorded message and watching in house, pray this prayer with me. Say, Father God, thank you so much for loving me so much that you gave your only son to die on the cross for my sin. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Today I give my life to you. I repent of my sin, and I declare today, I am born again. Amen. You were just born into spiritual intelligence right now. That deposited in you in that prayer is the very spirit of God, the very power of God. And you will find yourself having moments where you go, wow, that's an idea I never thought of before. And you'll go, maybe God had something to do with that. And he probably did. This time, I want to receive our tithes and offerings. Um, as I said, it, it makes no sense. Uh, logically, it's not logical. And I admit that. But it's proven that God is not a man that he can lie. And he said, I will open the windows of heaven. He will open the windows of heaven. What unlocks it so that he can open it is your obedience to give, to bring the tenth in, not the fifth, the tenth. Well, some people would probably need to bring the fifth in. But anyway, so... I didn't say where you were last night. He said the tenth, and that he would then open the windows of heaven. You see, God wants to pour out such a blessing, you won't have room enough to take. Now, our mind goes, hold it, I can't make it. I got, 100, I got to live on 100%. You will survive on 100%. You won't live on 100%. You can throw change at God all you want and say, well, you know, it'd be like, getting a bill at the restaurant saying, you know, I think I just want a tip. I don't want to pay the bill. You ain't getting out of that restaurant or you ain't coming back. What they're saying is pay the bill, give the tip. So the tithe is that which God says, this is what I'm giving you. I want 10% 
Then he says you can give and it'll be given, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That's the tip. Many people in Christianity today are tippers, they're not tithers. And they wonder why they're doing better, but they ain't doing the best. Because you don't trust God with a tenth, you trust him with a tip. I am in your business now. <laughs> but I would challenge you to try the tenth some of y'all have been tipping for a while, and that's better than not leaving anything for somebody. But when you start tithing, watch and see. And then he says this, then I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. So there you have it. Uh, if you want to give, there's QR code on the screen behind me. You can put your smartphone on that. It'll take you to a giving platform, or you can text the word give to 405-546-2226. Set it up there on a debit card or credit card. You can give on your way out. Uh, you can also go to our website, mosaicokc.church forward slash give. Or uh, you can also mail it to 5821 Northwest Expressway, 73132, right in Oklahoma City. All right? I'm going to ask our uh, prayer team to come to my left and your right. If you need prayer for any reason whatsoever, you're going through a tough time, you need a job, you just want help, help me with a spiritual intelligence, God. Whatever it is you need help. These people, the Bible says where two or more are gathered. When you gather with a prayer partner, it's like un it opens the heavens, I promise you. So visit one of them. Uh, if you want my weekly call on Wednesday nights, uh, it's, it's a two-minute or less call. It's required. I can't go any longer than that. Uh, so that'll help you a little bit. Uh, but you can uh, text the word call to 405-513-10. You can then follow that digital template. It'll put your name and number in. We'll put you in, and you'll get my Wednesday call. Usually at 6 o'clock, but my humanity slips, and sometimes I miss 6, or maybe it's a Thursday night, and some of you get really irritated. I didn't get my call last night. I love that. Every now and then, I want to do it intentionally just to irritate you, and here you go, I missed my call. It's when I'm insecure, all right? So uh, you want to serve, you can also text the word served, 405-513-10, and you can get involved right here uh, on a weekly basis, once a month, whatever you want to do, all right? Let's stand to our feet. First time here, stop by the welcome kiosk. We have a gift for you. I want to thank you for coming. Listen, it's going to be an awesome week. Your spiritual intelligence is up and you're aware and you're going to listen for the voice of God and the purpose of God's going to work through you. Let's go out with a shout. One, two, three. Hallelujah.